So uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we have the pleasure to welcome Professor Clint Conrad from the Center from Earth Evolution and Dynamics of the University of Oslo. And he's going to tell us and discuss sea level and the solid earth. So Clint, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you. And I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about one of my favorite topics and that is sea level. And one of the reasons that I'm interested in sea level as a solid earth geophysicist is that sea level in a way kind of uh, encompasses the net result of a whole lot of geophysical processes happening all around the world. And um, I, I kind of highlighted some of them here but it includes climate change processes and the Earth's response to climate change and solid Earth geodynamics, plate motions, and um, and a variety of different processes that I'll talk about today. So um, let me just, uh, I, I guess one of the things I, since I like sea level, I often try to take pictures of sea level. And this is one of them I took. It's just, uh, um, I'll show you a couple others. Uh, having trouble for moving. There we go. Um, yeah, just to em emphasize the importance of sea level in kind of today's world, but also in the geologic past, I took these photos of sea level. This is um, from when I lived in at in Hawaii. I worked at the University of Hawaii, and this photo kind of shows how the process, the human processes, uh, human activities go right up to the ocean uh, on land, and then uh, everything's totally different on the other side of sea level. And um, uh, so that's one from Hawaii. I took this one in, when I was visiting the Netherlands. And here you see that sea level and the land level are quite different. And this last one in Oslo was on a very high sea level day, a day where sea level was particularly high. And you can see some of the sea level is starting to flood the some of the some of the infrastructure, the sidewalk on the side here, and um, it just emphasizes that sea level is very important to modern modern life. And if it changes, there's going to be changes in all these different processes or all these different uh, scenes. Okay, so. We usually think about sea level as uh, as increasing through time. That's all pretty, uh, there's a lot of news reports about sea level change uh, and sea level rise happening right now. Um, but in some parts of the world, uh, sea level is not rising. It's actually dropping. And there have been certainly periods in Earth history where sea level dropped. And I'll just uh, talk briefly about this uh, rock in Sweden which um, was one of the first kind of modern measurements of sea level. It was, it's called the Celsius stone and it's named, uh, it was proposed, it was kind of first uh, pointed out by the same person who invented the Celsius uh, temperature scale. Um, it's, uh, a, it's a stone off the coast of Sweden and they marked the uh, level in 1731, 1831, 19, 200 years uh, of, of markings. And you can see the sea level there, at least, has been dropping. So, um, and it actually continues to drop now. And we'll get into, uh, I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, here's another place. I took this photo in Hawaii. And this is a photo of it's called Flat Island off the kind of the northwest, northeast coast of, of Oahu. And this picture is from coral that's about 120,000 years old. And it is obviously above sea level. So sea level must have dropped since, uh, since this coral was formed. And what this shows is the Sea level at a time 120,000 years ago it was the last interglacial period. So uh, between the big ice ages, there was a period that where sea level was thought to be even higher than it is today. And this is the time when that island was formed. 
And you can see that since that time, sea level has dropped significantly by about 120 meters. And then recently, in the last 20,000 years, it's risen. And the reason for this is that the great glaciers formed over Scandinavia and Canada, and Antarctica had more ice and Greenland too. And these, uh, these big, this big continental ice took up took up a lot of water from the oceans, which made sea level drop. And then when it started melting 20,000 years ago, sea level rose. And then if we go back much farther, then we have geologic maps of the world like this one, where we see that large parts of the continents were flooded. This is 105 million years ago, sort of kind of peak dinosaur time. And yes, a lot of parts of the continents were flooded, indicating a, a period of higher sea level. And this is kind of how we think sea level has changed over time scales of hundreds of millions of years. That there was a, it's gone down recently towards the present day. The last hundred million years have been a period of sea level drop uh, from about when sea level was about 200 meters higher. But during the time of Pangaea, when all the continents were together, that was a time of sea level low. And previous to that, as Pangaea was being assembled, it was in another time of, of relatively high sea level. These, uh, these estimates come from sedimentary records and also from estimates of uh, the fraction of the continents that were flooded at the time. And there's a lot of uncertainty. Okay, so what I want to do today is to talk about the solid earth processes that affect sea level. And I'll highlight, I've done some research on a lot of these, and I'll highlight some of my own research. And, um, but first I want to talk kind of generally about how you, how the solid earth can affect sea level. And one of the, uh, one of the ways we can think about this is to uh, just think about if you had a cup of water, how can we change the level of water in the cup? And there's, I thought of eight different ways that we can do this, but they generally come in three different categories. You can change the volume of water in the cup, the amount of water in the cup. You can change the kind of the container volume of the cup. If you make the cup bigger or smaller, that's going to change the level of the uh, of the water. Or you can change the shape of the container. And by doing that, you might make sea level go up in some places and down in others. And if we want to think about geologically relevant mechanisms using this cup as an analogy, then we could, for example, add ice or water to the cup. That's if we want to change the volume. So if we melt the glaciers into the ocean, that would cause sea level to go up. Um, other ways to, to change the water volume are to heat the water. So if you heat, heat up the water, it takes up, because of thermal expansion, it takes up more space and that causes water to go up. And that's a, it's a major uh, way that sea level is changing today. You could poke a hole in the bottom of the cup and it would slowly leak out over time. Uh, we can change the container volume, and that involves uh, maybe changing, maybe squeezing the cup or deforming, so just deforming it from the side or deforming it from underneath, or we can put objects in the cup, um, coins or something like that, and that would displace water and cause the sea level to rise. And then finally, we could tilt the cup. And that would cause sea level to go up in one side and down on the other. Or we could change, we could put something really heavy, really massive next to the cup, and that would pull water towards one side of the cup. And so all of these, these are eight different mechanisms. They all have geologically relevant uh, analogy. These are kind of, they, they all have uh, something geological that is, um, is uh, that they refer to. And so I'll talk about most of them today, I think. Okay, and actually, if we look at the geological analogies for these different mechanisms, we can kind of 
uh, rank them in terms of the time scale over which they happen. And this is what I came up with when I tried to do that. Uh, and of course, there's some of them operate on a range of time scales, but these, the, the slowest ones, like the slow leak, uh, happen on billions of years time scale. So on the, on the time scale of the age of the earth. And the fastest ones are relevant to time scales of uh, just years. So modern day climate change uh, is relevant to some of these. Okay, and I've also highlighted the ones that have solid earth processes associated with them uh, in brown. So those are the ones I'll really focus on. Today. Okay, so the biggest kind of the, the the way you usually think about solid, the solid earth changing sea level is through the changing shape of the seafloor. So if you have a period when the seafloor spreading is rapid, so it, this the plates are moving apart rapidly, then the mid-ocean ridge in the middle of the ocean is um, takes up more space at the bottom of the ocean, and it's just fatter. And uh, and it displaces sea level upwards. And then if you have a period when the plates are moving slower, then you'd have a thin profile and sea level would be down. Okay, so we do have constraints from plate tectonic reconstructions about uh, spreading rates in the past. And so we can make an estimate of how these things changed with time. And usually when you look at plate tectonic reconstructions, and these are, we have some that go back now to 400 million years about, uh, they look like this. You have positions of the continents and they're maybe more well constrained uh, than the positions of the oceans. And sometimes you're just kind of inferring a line here based on uh, that there must have been a ridge in the ocean somewhere because uh, we know that there's subduction on one side and it must have been sort of fast subduction. So you can kind of infer rates from that. And there's been a lot of work gone that has gone into this in recent years uh, to develop tectonic reconstructions for the past, including for the oceans. Okay, so um, one problem with these is that there's no, we don't have an indication of how, uh, of the bathymetry here. And that's what we really need to know in order to um in order to estimate sea level so i had a phd student he developed this kind of way of taking a tectonic reconstruction he added uh simply added tracers to the surface uh surface plates of this reconstruction and followed them and calculated the age as a fun age of the seafloor as a function of time and from the age of the seafloor you can estimate the depth the bathymetry and so when he did this, he made this, uh, he was able to calculate bathymetry and then sea level as a function of time. And so I'll show this in the blue is the geological observations of sea level. And the red is his prediction of sea level based on the tectonic reconstructions. Run that again. And you can see that there's some similarities that the uh, when Pangea was assembling kind of during this right go back kind of as Chang'e is assembling you had um relatively high high uh sea level and now when png is assembled the plate motions are a bit slower and you had thinner ridges and fewer ridges and that causes lower sea level and then as the plates begin to speed up uh separate up again around this time they yeah here's you can see spreading happening in the atlantic and uh, between africa and india for example these um as you develop these new ridges sea level goes goes up and then continues until now we've entered a period where the plates are um the ridge the ridge volume is decreasing again and you get sea level drop okay so to first order that process seems to work fairly well in terms of explaining sea level as a function of time for the past 400 million years. So um, one other mechanism that we've spent some time looking at is whether or not the water can be recycled into the interior of the earth. And 
just to explain this, we know that there's water coming out of the uh, of the mid ocean ridges and in plumes at volcanoes. We can detect some water in the uh, out out outgassing that happens there, and um, we think that there's water entering the earth at subduction zones. And the way that happens is water gets into the minerals of the um, of the lithosphere in the upper part of the uh, of the subducting plate, uh, those minerals become hydrated and they can carry water down with the slab. So that's um, kind of shown here. And if if they if they can get past the arcs in the in the uh, in the back arc, the volcanism that happens there, if it can get past that then you can draw water deep into the mantle and it has a chance of staying down there and the mantle itself can be a reservoir for, um, for long-term storage of, of Earth's water. Okay, and one thing that um, if you look at the kind of the, the petrology of the minerals uh, that carry water is that hydrated the hydrated minerals of the slab are tend to be more stable for colder slabs. So if um, if you have slabs that are colder, they can they can hold more water and they can hold it longer as 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 the as the slab enters the uh, the upper mantle. This is a study from Van Kecken et al who looked at this specifically developed models for different slabs. So you had a really cold slab this might be for Japan. A really warm slab might be for Cascadia. This is some um, really young lithosphere that's subducting and fairly slowly. So it, so it's um it's warm. And then track the different minerals as they move through this temperature field. And what's shown in the kind of the gray blue here is the amount of water that's being brought down in these minerals. And what you see is the colder slabs bring more water down into the in, into deeper depths and past the arc, whereas this um, warm slab in Cascania loses all its water. And then you could do this for all slabs around the world. And what they predicted was that more water was going down in some slabs and less in other slabs. Okay, so we applied this to the tectonic reconstruction to see how this has happened back in time. And what we found, what uh, and this was Christer Carlson who did this work, uh, what he found was that there were periods of Earth history, say about 130 million years ago, when the, um, when the continents were starting to break up, where plate speeds were fast and slabs were relatively cold and a lot of water was being trans transported down into the Earth's interior. Whereas today, much less water is going is going down. In fact, most of it's in the Western Pacific uh, and a little bit maybe in South America. But compare these numbers, it's three times faster. Uh, this is petagrams per year. Uh, three times faster water flux rate going down into the deep earth uh, at 130 million years ago compared to now. And then if you... Uh, estimate this as a function of time. This is the sea level change that would happen that would result from this. Now, there's a lot of assumptions that go into this, including you have to estimate the rate of which water is coming out of the ridges and some other parameters associated with how much is going down. But if you scale these things kind of relative to each other over time, what you see is that for these different models that you uh, that you assume. Uh, this period, one hundred and about one hundred and thirty million years ago, was a pul was a was a time when you had a pulse of water that was going down into the interior. Now, how that is exactly balanced by water coming out of the interior depends on some of these unknown parameters. But what he suggested is that the amount of water going into the interior changes with time, and there's some periods where there's a lot of water going in. And just crude estimates, we estimated maybe up to 150 meters of water of sea level drop in about 200 million years. If you take 
uh, kind of general estimates of how much water can be wrapped up in the minerals uh, of a subducting slab. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, it's, uh, yes. I would also mention, this is, I, I, uh, I, I will also mention that as the earth cools, we would expect that slabs on average would get colder with time and a colder slab holds more water. So as the earth cools slowly over time, we would expect that more and more water would become incorporated in slabs and enter into the mantle. So ultimately, and this is why I call that a slow leak, is that the fate of a large part of our oceans might be that they drain into the Earth's mantle over time. And it's thought that possibly we've already lost some, some water uh, from the Earth's oceans into the interior as, as, uh, as time has gone uh, during Earth's history. Okay, I wanna move on to other mechanisms. Um, I did some work looking at how much water is displaced by all the islands around the earth and also the sediments. So for example, this is the islands of Hawaii with the surrounding bathymetry. And for example, the island of Oahu, just it being placed in the oceans, uh, takes up, it causes sea level to be about three centimeters higher uh, than it would, than sea level would be if it didn't, if you didn't have Oahu in the ocean. So there's a lot of different islands around the world. So if, and also little seamounts at the bottom of the ocean. And if the number of the kind of the volume of these seamounts changes with time, then you could expect that see, that would affect sea level. Similarly, uh, and you can see this process here that see how the Northern side of Oahu is slumped off into the, in, into the ocean and that sediment that deposition of sediments would have also caused um sea level to be a little bit higher and as a result uh, so sediments also should displace sea level upwards and if that changes with time you can estimate that it would uh, it would also change uh sea level okay so these are estimates of um kind of these are catalogs of the number of seamounts and I calculate it and also the sediments, sediment thickness all over the oceans in the color. So the dots are all seamounts and the colors are, are sediments. And what you can see is that there's a lot of seamounts. Some basins have more seamounts than others. Uh, the sum of the seamounts are certainly buried by the sediments. For example, we have thick sediments here near the equator in the Pacific and few seamounts there. And I would think that that's probably because um, many of the sediments, many of the seamounts are buried under those sediments. Similarly, on the, the slopes of the passive margins in the Atlantic, you have really thick sediments. And in some places you have uh, very few seamounts. So you can make estimates of how this changes with time by looking at the volume of sediments and the volume of volume of seamounts as a function of seafloor age, and then kind of go back in time and estimate how those things have changed with time. And what we found, I don't have time to go into the details of it, is that the, sub, uh, the volcanism probably is associated with the sea level drop, and sediments have been probably associated with the sea level rise over time. Uh, in the past 70 million years. So that's kind of the the trend. And the volcanics is probably the biggest thing is probably that big, uh, um, there was a lot of Cretaceous volcanism, especially in the Pacific, and that is being subducted. So you're losing a lot of volcanism and that's associated with the drop. And sediments, as the seafloors get, uh, as the seafloor gets older and on average older, the it has more time to accumulate sediments so you get an uh, a net accumulation of sediments and sea level rise okay um another mechanism i mentioned is to deform the sides of the cup the analogy for that would be the um 
if uh, you have continent collision, for example. If you have continents colliding, then you uplift Tibet, for example, north of India, and uh, that takes up, that makes the continents smaller and the oceans bigger, and that causes sea level drop. And so when you have a big period of continental uh, orogeny, then you'd have sea level drop associated with that. And this is, a uh, it's, we estimated about 25 meters of sea level drop associated with Tibet. And of course, over time, this is gonna erode down and fill with fill the oceans back with sediments. So that, um, and and also some of the continents have, have uh, extensional features on the passive margins. And so that can, that can be a mechanism by which sea level can rise from this. So there's sort of a long-term balance, presumably. Okay, so we added all these up and what we, um, and the ridge volume is the biggest one, but we estimated changes of these other mechanisms. And what you get is the, uh, the dashed line here. And then if you add, and that's that's all the mechanisms that change the the volume of the ocean basin. And then if you go from the dashed line to the solid line, that represents that that is um the solid line includes changes in the water volume associated with a drop in sea level that is inferred from slabs bringing water into the mantle. So at least with this, tally of the sea level components, it seems that the uh, a loss of water to subduction zones may help match the sea level budget against the observations. Okay, I want to go towards more recent times now and look at this period of um, of of time in the last 20,000 years when the ice sheets and this is uh, the Scandinavian ice sheet, uh, were melting. And so it's this last 20,000 years of sea level rise. And this uh, period was a period of large melting of ice sheets. And it's something similar to what's proposed for the future with Greenland and Antarctica losing ice. So it's a good analogy to what, uh, to what we might expect in the future if uh, climate change continues. Um, I would point out that the fastest rate of sea level rise was about 14.5 thousand years ago, and it was 50 millimeters a year of global sea level rise due to melting of mostly in Canada, but also Scandinavian ice. And 50, by contrast, we think that sea level is rising about three millimeters per year. So it can get much faster than what we're experiencing today. There are periods in the past, this is kind of age as a function of time, or uh, uh, sea level, this is sea level as a function of time. And there you can see the, the period of um, low sea level during Pangaea. But what I wanna point out is that this record shows short time scale variations, just a few million years. And you can see we are familiar with these for the recent times because of the Milankovitch cycles changing the volume of glaciers on the surface and not. But what's interesting is that you also see these fluctuations for greenhouse times as well, for times when the whole earth was much warmer than it is today. And they're not noticeably that much smaller during greenhouse times compared to ice house times. And one of the uh, ideas for why you can still get uh, rapid swings in sea level uh, when you don't have big glaciers on the surface, big ice sheets on the surface, is that it's possible that it was um, stored in the uh, in the aquifers. And I, I just uh, mentioned this uh, this figure here. It's um you can see the uh, this, this is the evidence for this is that these sediment layers were taken from a Cretaceous sequence and during a period of relatively otherwise high sea level, it's still fluctuating in these um, in these different layers with 
sea level changes of about 25 million meters happening over a time scale of a million years. And you can see it in some of the other uh, sedimentary records also. And one mechanism for uh, for for this to happen is that you the Milankovitch cycles were still causing climate change during these warm periods, but they were causing climate change uh, by drying out the continents or big parts of the continents uh, versus making them wetter. And so you have some periods like this would be a time of high sea level when continents were relatively dry. And so not a lot of water stored in the aquifers there and other periods when the continents were relatively wet and you had a lot of lakes and, and, um, and water stored in the continental aquifers. And so the proposal is that you cycle between these two states during, associated with the Milankovitch cycle um, during a warm greenhouse periods of Earth's history. How does the Earth respond to large changes in the mass of either aquifers or glaciers on the surface? So all that all that water that's on a continent, whether it's in the aquifers or in big ice sheets, uh, is heavy and it pushes the surface of the Earth down. And if you melt it or dry out the continents, then you the solid Earth responds over time scales of several thousand years uh, by a viscous flow of the mantle back into the space that was pushed away by the weight of all that water. And this, this process is called, sometimes people call it post-glacial rebound, sometimes it's called glacial isostatic adjustment. And, and the rate at which it happens depends on the mantle viscosity. Okay, so we have this process going on in Scandinavia right now. And this is where the Celsius stone is that I showed you earlier. And uh, there was a big ice sheet here, it melted and, uh, and the earth is still responding to that. And what is shown in the colors here are GPS measurements of the earth uplift. And the red colors our faster uplift, it's going upwards at 10 millimeters per year in, in, off the coast of Sweden. In Norway, it's slower, only a few millimeters per year. So what we, um, and then if you get even farther away, uh, you have a negative value. So that would be sea level drop. So, um, or land surface drop. Okay. So in a way, this sea, we have sea level drop over across most of Scandinavia, despite the, the sea level rise happening everywhere else in the world. Um, in Scandinavia, we have sea level drop because the land surface is rising. We did a little bit of work to try to take into account vertical motions of the uh, of the Earth when estimating a global global uh, rate for sea level rise, and so basically we took tide gauge stations around the world where sea level is being measured, and corrected them for vertical land motions, and this is we found the red curve. And what we've uh, previous studies that didn't take in, this into account, like we give the purple curve, the church in white, for example. What um, what our study suggests is that sea level rise prior to about 1990 was actually slower than uh, what you would predict if you didn't take this into account. But then more recently, all the curves agree that it's over three millimeters per year including the satellite measurements shown in the yellow. So uh, this would imply that sea level rise has accelerated over the last 100 years uh, from a, about one millimeter per year during the first part of the century to and, and then about three millimeters per year after 1990. So that means that sea level rise has been accelerating. 
if we look at the satellite information, that is really interesting because it shows variations in sea level rise as a, as a function of time, but just during the last, say, two decades or a little bit, two and a half decades. The, um, uh, this is kind of the rate, the average rate over all of the, uh, of the earth from taken from satellite measurements of sea level change. And you can see it's everywhere about three millimeters per year. Uh, if you take out the average about three millimeters per year, you can see sea level is rising faster in some areas and slower in some areas. So the Western, the Western Pacific and some parts of the Indian Ocean are rising uh, faster than the Eastern Pacific, for example. Now, this was largely reflecting changes in the heat content of the oceans, changes in the currents and the wind speeds, but also some solid earth uh, changes. So I want to talk some about the solid earth changes that might be going into this, but also should become more important in the future as the rate of melting increases. Okay, so um, the recent changes, uh, this is from the IPCC, IPCC report 2019. Um, the volume of water going into the, uh, into the oceans was about 1.3 millimeters per year of sea level rise. It comes from the glaciers, Greenland and Antarctica. And then thermal expansion was had a bigger amount, 1.4 millimeters of sea level rise. So you compare these two and um, they're approximately equal, but, uh, but heating the water, thermal expansion of the water is, um, is the largest effect for recent times. But if you look at these pr these predictions for the future um, of how much how much sea level rise is coming from each one of these different components, I just fit a slope to the kind of what we might expect it to be in 2100 from these different mechanisms. Then Greenland Antarctica glaciers are giving 10 millimeters per year of sea level rise but thermal expansion is only increased to 4 millimeter, 4.5 millimeters. So these changes in the land, the, the water that's sequestered on land should be changing faster than the thermal expansion. So that means we really need to think about what the earth does in response to losing a lot of water on land, from land, because that is the projected future of sea level change. And a lot of it's coming from ice melting into the oceans. Okay, so how does the earth respond on timescales of just decades or 100 years to, uh, to melting of ice? And over long time scales, I discussed how you have a viscous flow of the mantle back into the, into the space uh, that, was, that the ice leaves. But on short time scales, instantaneously, the earth uh, kind of snaps back like a rubber band. Uh, and there's an elastic response uh, of instantaneous uplift associated with the instant, the, the moment you lose the ice, the earth responds. Also happening at the same time is that you don't have this big mat. If you don't have the big mass here anymore, then the ocean is not uh, gravitationally as attracted to that space. So it falls away. So you have two things going on. You have the land going up and the ocean falling away when you lose the, lose the ice. And those two things, uh, those two things together cause sea level drop right in the close by vicinity of where you're losing the ice, but um, faster sea level rise elsewhere. So I calculated this uh, for, this is the, the, estimate of the mass loss from the continents in about 2013. And so you have melting in Greenland, Antarctica, and some of the mountain glaciers. And this, the average over the entire oceans is 1.5 millimeters per year. That's how much water is going into the oceans of sea level rise. But you can see that you have less sea level rise near Greenland, near Antarctica, near some of the ocean uh, near some of the glaciers that are melting. And so you have slower sea level rise near those places where the ice is coming from. 
and you have faster sea level rise other places like for example hawaii gets extra sea level rise uh, about half up to um a, a fraction of about 0 0.3 millimeters per year of sea level rise extra because hawaii is far away from those places so you don't have the gravitational uh and the land surface effects anymore one interesting study that we did is we looked at instead of ice melting, you could think about it as groundwater loss. So when there are models for how, how groundwater has been depleted in the last hundred years, it's um, contributed about 26 millimeters of sea level rise. That's the brown bar here. So what I'm showing in the ocean, well, the continents, the colors in the continents show the, the amount of groundwater loss. So the big places are India, Pakistan, kind of this area, and Western United States, where there's been a lot of groundwater loss. And see, that's contributed about 26 millimeters of sea level rise in the past century to, um, and that is uh, in the, the kind of the brown is the average. So anywhere on the blue side of the brown line, has less sea level rise because you're close to the places where the sea level is being, where the groundwater is being depleted. And everywhere away from there uh, in the red colors has faster sea level rise. And uh, what you can see is, yes, the continents are surrounded by less sea level rise than average. Uh, and in particular, this would predict that India and California would have slower sea level rise in the past hundred years. And um, indeed, if you look at the sea level records there, they are, they are slower than the average. Okay, um, kind of the last thing I wanna do is talk a little bit about a project that I've been involved with. Uh, it's called the Magpie Project. And what we're doing is looking at the, well, our, our ultimate goal is to look at the response of the land in Greenland, the, the ground in Greenland to, to melting of the ice sheet there. And this is a picture I took as we flew onto the ice sheet. And what you can see are all these little puddles on the surface of the ice sheet. This is the edge of the Greenland ice sheet on the West Coast. And uh, these are uh, places where the ice sheet is melting. So this is the Greenland ice sheet melting in kind of real time. And the, we have observations of uplift on the edge of Greenland. And they're shown in the colors here and the dots. So these are GPS observations and some places are faster than others. Now what this, what the idea is that is that this, there's two parts to this that contribute to this. There's the Earth's response to past deglaciation, uh, the, the melting of Scandinavian ice and Canada ice, but also in Greenland. And what, what's shown here is the uh, model prediction of how that uplift is happening, uh, should be happening today. Uh, 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 the Earth's response to sea level today in vertical ground motion. And then the recent melting should also produce a, uh, a vertical response. And this is the elastic response, the instantaneous elastic response to vertical, to present day melting. And so that's shown in the top panel here. And if you add these together and put them in the background of this, you can see there's a reasonable correspondence to where we predict rapid uplift, say on the coasts and some places more than others, but some areas like this area here with the rapid uh, uplift seems to be going faster than we would expect. And maybe there's additional melting there that uh, is not incorporated into some of this, or maybe uh, the subsurface has different rock properties that allow for faster uplift. And so what we were looking for or here's one idea is that um, is that the Iceland plume or Greenland passed over the Iceland plume between about 60 and 90 million years ago. And it might have crossed, say, here, which kind of corresponds to these areas of rapid uplift. 
And if it did pass, then it might have left behind a kind of a scar underneath the continent, the coast of uh, underneath the lithosphere of Greenland of warm, heated material. So it might, if it's still warm under there, under this part of Greenland, then maybe that has lower viscosity and you can get more rapid uplift. That was, a, that was what we're looking for. So what we did is we went to the interior of Greenland and we went to several places. I'll show a map in a minute, but um, this is one place. We went to this East Grip station, which is on the Northeast Greenland ice stream. And what we brought with us is uh, magnetotelluric equipment, which can measure the electrical conductivity of the rocks beneath the ice. And uh, electroconductivity has, I don't have really time to get into the details, but it relates to the temperature and the water content of the rocks. And both of those things, water, temperature, water content and temperature can affect the viscosity. So what we're basically doing is using magnetotellurics on the ice sheet to try to look for regions of low viscosity in the upper mantle. So we we went to this place and we made magnetotelluric stations and all these pink dots. And this is the first scale, this is 100 kilometers. And then over the whole ice sheet, we also went to Southern Greenland. Uh, and this is a Raven camp, which has basically uh, a, there is a station there, but it's mostly just a um, a runway where we uh, were able to fly into and out of. And at that location, we had to end up camping most of the time. And then we went to Summit Station where there is a research station and then East Grip Station. And East Grip Station, we weren't camping there. We were just staying in uh, in the station there. And we do day trips out. That's about as far as you can kind of drive in a day and come back. But in these two other locations, we did multi-day excursions around. And this is what, just to show you some, uh, show you kind of what it's like up on the ice sheet. This is uh, what we were doing. We were installing magnetotelluric equipment, which is a lot of digging in the snow and installing the equipment. You leave it there for about a week as it makes measurements and you come back and pick it up. And uh, this is how we got around on snowmobiles, dragging these sleds. And this was the team of the three of us that were at Raven Camp. And uh, Kate Selway was the uh, was the leader of this project. She organized. And this is a little bit of just for interest, it's sort of a diversion, but it's what it was like. We had big storms that came through. And when that happens, you can't really do anything. Uh, we had um, cold nights that went down to, I think, minus 40 Celsius. So, um, so we had to be prepared for extreme cold and this is even during May. So even when it's starting to get warmer on the ice sheet and this is, um, Sastrugi are these, are these, uh, it's kind of like a big sand dune in the snow and it's made formed by wind. It's kind of like wind erosion of the snow and it made driving really, really difficult in, at times. We had to worry about polar bears. So we had an electric fence around our tent, uh, which I'm not sure really would have done a great job of dealing with a polar bear, deterring a polar bear that got that close. But maybe more helpful were these uh, motion sensors that would detect anything moving. And these unfortunately did go off sometimes and it was uh in the sun they would see the sun and then go off so this is kind of what it was like a lot of the time on the ice and just this is the last slide i think of i have of greenland but just so you can see what it's like this is a stormy day but it's kind of what it was like okay so if we do well, and we are, we're we still analyzing the data that we got, but we did get data in all three of those locations, then we should be able to uh, estimate, um, we're hoping that we're going to be able to estimate the visco variations in viscosity around the, uh, across the ice sheet, or beneath the ice sheet. And that will help us to calibrate how much 
how much of, of that uplift is associated with recent melting versus past melting. Okay, and if we do well, these measurements should go into better, gaining better constraints on sea level change for the present day, because then we could estimate how much, uh, how much ice needs to melt in order to explain the uplift observations. Okay, so if we do that well, we'll be able to kind of get better predictions of future sea level change and also variations in sea level change from place to place. And as an example, uh, this is the tide gauge record for Oslo, which is right here. And it's closer to the center of that ice, a big ice sheet. And you can see it's um, sea level drop, but the drop is getting less steep in recent times. And that's because of sea level rise going on elsewhere. And then in Bergen, which is on the on the coast, even farther away, we have very little sea level drop. And in recent times, it's been sea level rise. So this is something that is um, is coming for uh, for Scandinavia and everywhere. And uh, it's good to think about how uh, humans should or can respond to it on our coastal cities. Um, one thing that is probably the first thing that we would notice is that kind of high sea level events when the wind is blowing in a certain way and fast enough to pile the ocean up against the seashore is um, these events happen more often. So, so a sea level that you'd see only once a century in the future will happen on once a year, for example, or one once a decade becomes much more common once a month. So that's the first thing you'd notice. And we're already seeing that in places that the highest water levels, for example, in Bergen, uh, which is on it's in the western coast of Norway, uh, had some of its highest levels ever in just in the last couple of years. So we uh, and they're starting to think about uh, protection mechanisms just for these certain days of the year when the sea level is very high because the wind is blowing the water up the coast and you can build these structures just real temporary to protect the infrastructure. So those are some of the things to, to think about. Um, so I'm just going to conclude. Uh, I want I made this uh, <clears throat> this diagram which shows the ways that sea level is changing as a function of time. And a lot of these are affected by the solid earth. So this on the x-axis is the time scale in years. So it goes from years to decades to centuries and millennia, millions of years and hundreds of millions of years to billions of years on this far edge. And then these are the different mechanisms in different colors and the amplitude of sea level change from meters to kilometers. And so over the longest times, billions of years, if the oceans are draining into the interior, then you can get thousands of meters of sea level change associated with that. Whereas um, if you have sustained sea level change that can do several, maybe even 100 meters <coughs> of sea level rise uh, associated with the long-term growth or shrinkage of ice sheets. Um, the You can cycle ice between the continents and the oceans, by or cycle water between the continents and, and the oceans as ice in the ice house times and as groundwater in the ground in the greenhouse times. And then there's a variety of other mechanisms operating on kind of these intermediate times between short, uh, between less than a million years and more than a million. No, less than a million years and about 100 million years. That these, these time scales, seafloor volcanism, continental collision, these are tectonic factors that operate on time scales of tens to hundreds of millions of years, and they affect sea level. <laughs> so the, um, the solid earth component of this, I've tried to highlight here. It's um, the largest component for time scales longer than about a million years and it's significantly it's significant even for recent even for modern day climate change okay i uh just in conclusion i wanted to mention that at least for me 
uh, getting more involved in studying sea level because it encompasses all kinds of different uh, processes happening in the oceans and the climate and the solid earth, that it brings together a lot of different fields. So it makes it a really interesting thing to study as um, I, and I just tried to list a lot of the different ones that I've kind of had to put together to um, to give this talk. And just in conclusion, uh, the solid earth affects sea level on all time scales on decades to centuries. It's import uh, the solid earth is important because the land responds to the ice that, or the groundwater that's being lost from the continents. And so that produces a deformation that affects the land surface and also the sea surface. You have that happening on timescales of thousands to millions of years with the Earth's viscous response as well. And that is um, something that uh, we're still trying to understand. Uh, it's possible that variations in the mantle viscosity could change that quite a bit. Um, so that's a new area that um, at least I'm going into is to think about how variations in viscosity can affect that. And then over long time scales, plate tectonic time scales of millions to billions of years, there's a variety of tectonic feature uh, processes that affect sea level. Sea level kind of measures the average of a lot of these things averaged over the earth and through time. And uh, the loss of water to the interior should also affect, should be one of these processes that people consider. Okay, I think that's my last slide, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you about this today. Thanks. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It was uh, very, very interesting. Um, I hope we'll have uh, many questions. So we already have a, a comment from Charles uh, Forrester who says, thank you. Sorry to have to vanish, but absolutely fascinating presentation. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I um I have found it fascinating myself to study these different different mechanisms. Yeah, we we got that from your talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So been... any questions, you can uh, either put put it in the chat or raise uh, your hands and uh, unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Would it be better if I stop sharing? Um or unless no, I have to go back. Yeah, because okay. you may want to show a slide. Uh -huh. in the hmm. It's so fascinating that everyone now <laughs> is. <laughs> okay, Alink, Alink. Yeah. Ah, thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Clinton, for the wonderful talk showing the different mechanisms and. Uh, they are how they each of them affects of the sea level actually the ocean level because it's my question will be about some relief sea and particularly the area where i was born it's the caspian sea mm -hmm. this is not related actually to what you were speaking about because it's not a present sea it is just the biggest lake of the, on the earth but still uh, it is a part of the former ocean, so let's say Neotetis ocean. And uh, the change is dramatically fast, going up and down, up and down. And on the scale, exactly what, what you showed for the, let's say, 400 million years, the similar features can be squeezed to the something like uh, 10,000. Years <laughs> with a uh, yeah very large uh, oscillations on the within the some decade uh, lengths and uh, with the one meters for the let's say uh, ten to twenty years you know and particularly now it's going down it was uh, just that in twenty thirty years ago one meter raised up now it's going down with a uh, so great yeah. Definitely, there are many other mechanisms for this to be explained, like uh, water, uh, let's say rivers, uh, um, you know, charge and the 
uh, other things related to particular report is this area for the uh, seas which are uh, sucking water and there is uh, evaporation and so on. But still, still, which of these eight mechanisms which you specifically mention uh, some contribution to such kind of the very fast change of the level of the sea or the biggest lake. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that is certainly interesting. And I haven't studied that particular area, but uh, in too much detail, but um, but one there, you're right. There are a lot of things that are similar about that. And, uh, but one thing that isn't, uh, that is different about big lakes versus the ocean is that the big lakes still have the ocean as a buffer in a way in that if there's a climate change or something that is happening in a lake uh, that affects the lake volume so the climate starts to dry out the ultimate place where that water goes would be the ocean uh so um in a sense it's it's uh in a sense the the ocean kind of takes the takes the the any kind of imbalance uh that you feel in a in an individual lake that effect would be uh the opposite in in the opposite ocean and there's tectonic things could also affect the lakes uh especially the bigger lakes like that so you have those processes happening slowly over time and um but really i, I think it's probably the volume of water in the lake that is that's affected most and that's probably associated with the balance or imbalance of the local or kind of regional climate Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any, uh, we have a comment from uh, Laurent Husson. I need to go to thanks, Clint. Hope mm. to see you soon. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, Laurent, has, Laurent has contributed to some of my ideas or my thoughts on on uh, sea level, and we've written some papers on this. Okay. Uh, any other comments? No, looks like uh, today it's uh, you made it so interesting that uh, <laughs> nobody uh, is asking questions. Um, well, if people have um have questions they think of later and want to email me, I'm always happy to discuss on email. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. A lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw the observation about the the effect of the mental print race quite interesting actually. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the observation of what? Uh, about the plume trace, the connection with the plume yeah. uh, trace. Uh, I thought it was uh, interesting. I never thought about it, actually. So it was uh, it was good that I, I, yeah. Yeah, there's probably a lot of components that affect the, that could lead to lateral variations in viscosity. The plumes are one, but kind of the edge of a craton is another and, and, yeah. um, Sometimes those things lead to volcanism, but it might also affect the the glacial isostatic adjustment process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll um, we'll stop it there. I'm going to stop the recording. I mm -hmm. wanted to thank uh, you, Clint, for this uh, superb talk, and I also wanted to thank everyone uh, joining here this afternoon. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.